Hello, everybody. This is David Montesano, founder of College Match. Today, I'm talking with Dr. Patty Weiss. Patty's a great friend of mine and actually the person that we refer most of our families to for the neuroeducational testing. Just giving you a little bit of Patty's background. She speaks six different languages, French, Spanish, Italian, Hindi, and Urdu. Since the age of 15, she was a professional violinist and worked all over the world with the Gypsy King, Smokey Robinson, and the Trans-Siberian Orchestra. And I'd like to go ahead and give a warm welcome to Patty Weiss. Hi, Patty. How are you doing? Hi, Hi David. Nice to see you. Great, Patty. It's great to see you too. And I wanted to just start with a really great question that I know is on the minds of a lot of our parents. What is an educational assessment or a neuro, a neuro educational assessment? And what, what, how do they work? That's an excellent question. A neuroeducational assessment. Um, assessment is the word that is often used instead of testing, but they mean the same thing. And it's a group of measures. They can also be called a group of tests. Um, about 35% to 40% are cognitive, meaning looking at the student's thinking. Um, there are five main domains in the cognitive realm. And then we also have the psychological realm, and, uh, which includes emotional. And in the cognitive realm, we look at verbal comprehension, ver visual spatial ability, fluid reasoning, like visual spatial reasoning, um, working memory, which is auditory memory, as well as uh, visual memory. And the fifth and last domain cognitively is processing speed, which is a uh, graphomotor speed. For instance, uh, how fast can one read a sentence and circle yes or no? How fast can one do math problems? So it's cognitive and also emotional. And um, this group of measures or tests is given over usually a period of three sessions. Uh, any, it can be from two to four sessions, but generally about a total of uh, five to seven hours. And we try to pinpoint the etiology, you know, the underlying reason for the difficulty that the student is having uh, with standardized testing or with homework or with whatever difficulties they are having at school or with standardized testing. That way we can pinpoint the problem and basically try to fix it as much as possible with accommodations and um, all kinds of help and uh, opportunities. Great, thank you, that's very helpful. I think our audience will really wanna know that. One thing that I get asked a lot, and this is part of our you know, college admission advising is, you know, it can certainly, having a disability or learning challenge can actually put, say, lower grades or lower test scores in context. But let me ask you a question before we get into that part of it, which is this, you know, basically, if, if what are some of the signs, I guess, that I may need to have my student tested? Are there specific kind of red flags that you end up seeing with, with students? Uh, yes. Um, I worked for 15 years at um, St. Mary's Hospital on the Adolescent Unit with the kids that were having a lot of difficulties. Um, but I, you know, the whole spectrum from that to also uh, gifted children at the Nueva School and many private schools and public schools in San Francisco. And usually the, the signs and symptoms that would bring a family in to have the student tested would be that the child the student was doing really what one possibility was that child was doing very well uh, on their homework but they were having tremendous problems with standardized testing that's one situation another situation is that the child was getting a's and b's but at great 
challenge and difficulty to themselves. It would take them four to six hours a night to do their homework. And so that was another question, what's going on there? And another question um, or situation that would bring the family in would be that the child seemed behaviorally to have some difficulties um, at school or social difficulties. So there's a whole panoply of different scenarios, but those are the major scenarios. And I guess I would say the very main one is where the child is doing fairly well at school, but having a lot of trouble with standardized testing. And we really try to pinpoint the etiology, the reason for this, so that we can go ahead and, and really take care of it. Thank you. Um, and how do you individualize each test for, for say, my child? Or, you know, and which test would you provide and how long does each one take? Just yes, roughly. excellent question. Um, so, um, what the first thing I do is I have a no fee um, verbal consultation, uh, generally over the phone or Zoom. Um, depending on the scenario with the pandemic, it can even be in person. It's, there's absolutely no fee for the consultation. It usually lasts an hour to, can be an hour and a half. And I like to get the history of this child, you know, um, literally from birth to present day. And I like to get the um, last few years of school history and the grades and, and then I'm able to start to put together um, an idea and a profile of what's going on. And then I can choose the first sessions testing. Um, almost always the first sessions testing will include the Wexler Intelligence Scale for Children fifth edition. That's the gold standard of cognitive testing. And that's the one that I had alluded to previously in our conversation with these five domains, verbal comprehension, visual, spatial, fluid reasoning, working memory, processing speed. So that takes an hour and a half. Um, it can be as quick as an hour and 20 minutes. It can take up to two hours, but about an hour and a half. And then I instantly score it, takes maybe 15, 20 minutes to score that. And I then give a, the Beck Youth Inventories, which are five one page questionnaires, goes by pretty quick, takes maybe 20 minutes. And so that whole session would be about two to two and a half hours for the first session. And that shows me the child's, the first page talks about the child's self-esteem. The second talks about any of the child's worries or concerns. The third page talks about any of the child's feelings of possible sadness or again, uh, depressive or worried symptoms. Um, the fourth page looks at anger and the fifth page looks at behavior. And so after that first session, I go home and I really go through everything. And then I'm able to get a really much better idea, adding that to the information I got from mom or dad during our interview and really put together what should be the next session's testing. And so I may have found that in the... Um, Wexler, um, the WISC, the Wexler Intelligence Skill, that on one subtest, there's a subtest called Digit Span, where I give the child some numbers and they repeat them back, that the child had great difficulty listening, encoding the information, and retrieving it. That's a tiny red flag, and I want to follow that up on the second session with the Woodcock-Johnson and also possibly the test of auditory processing. And I wanna see, is there a difficulty with auditory processing? There may or may not be, but, but so that's just an example of a little red flag that could lead 
to the second session's choice of measures and tests. And then after the second session, which usually includes the Woodcock-Johnson tests of achievement, um, and by the way, the WISC, the Woodcock-Johnson tests of achievement, and a third test of reading for um, K through eight, it's the Gray Oral Reading Test, Fort, uh, fifth edition. Uh, for the uh, high school kids, it's the Nelson Denny Reading Test. And for older kids, but also it can be for younger kids, there's the extra Woodcock Reading Mastery Test. Um, so those three are the requirements, the three mandatory requirements of the SSAT, the SAT, and the PSAT, the board. They want those tests and those scores to see if the student um, is eligible for accommodations. And so that kind of defines the first and second session. And in the third session, I really get into the pinpointing of that particular student's difficulties and, and strengths. And, and strengths are very important. And we will look at both. And then we really start to put together a roadmap of how to help this child, the student, this teen, the best way possible to allow them to use their intellect and their ability and their talents to the absolute top level. That's great. And I, and I know firsthand, you know, some of the students of, of ours that you've worked with and we've shared, you've been able to really help them pinpoint exactly as you said, pinpoint these not only not only strengths, but also their challenges and in such a nice way that, you know, basically they were able to get extra time on uh, the SAT or ACT or both and also accommodation from their high schools and in their classes, which made a big difference in their grades. And I you know, I, one thing I wanted to ask you, though, is now that we're dealing with, you know, sheltering at home and slowly opening up, um, is this something, though, that can be done 100% online with, with a student? Or is there still a component, and I'm assuming there is, of this since you're, you're highly regulated, you know, specialty, right, as far as psychology goes, that still needs to be done in person? And I just wanted you to speak to that and also to the fact that you can do this anywhere in the US or anywhere in the world if, if someone does want you to come to them. Yes, I, I have traveled all over the world. Um, I have done testing everywhere from um, Texas to Delaware, to New York, to the Philippines, to France, to Ireland, the Republic of Ireland. Um, gone there myself and done the testing. Um, also though, very good question about the pandemic, COVID-19 right now. I'd say that about 60 to 70% of the testing can, can be done on Zoom. Um, Pearson, which is the company that puts out most of the measures, the testing, um, has an online program um, that is called, uh, there's one called Q Interactive and another called Q Global. Q Global is the scoring program that I've used for many years for the Woodcock Johnson and the other tests and the WISC and so on and forth. Q Interactive is a newer program where the child is able to see the stimulus book, you know, with the puzzles and the um, patterns and uh, the pictures and the vocabulary right up here, right in front of them. So Q Interactive is, an, is a new program that I'm using that allows me to do a lot more of the testing on Zoom. And, but about 20% um, is, does need to be done in person. And there, we're being very creative these days and, you know, American ingenuity, I mean, you know, not American, but, you know, people's ingenuity in general, everyone has a lot of ingenuity. And this situation is creating um, a spike in ingenuity and we're learning how to work with that. But I always am very careful to follow all the rules of the Board of Psychology. It's very important. And 
Um, there are about 20% block design is one example, and there are some others, coding and some search must be done in person. Aside from those, we can really do a lot on, on Zoom. So, um, so that's the way it's working now. And as this pandemic progresses and hopefully a vaccine is developed, et cetera, hopefully as things get better, you know, um, parents will feel more comfortable with the testing being done in person. Until that point though, much of it can be done over Zoom. What, just, you know, in the instance of the SAT, SSAT, or ACT, in other words, the standardized testing that most students have to go through either to get into private uh, day schools or boarding schools or college or university, if a student with, has difficulties with those tests, which tests do the boards require in order to deserve accommodations? Excellent question. Um, I, I alluded to this a little bit um, uh, about 12, 10 minutes ago. Um, there are three major tests that they want. Number one is the Wexler Intelligence Scale for Children. That's from age eight to age 16. Um, once one turns 16, you have a choice in the year from 16 to 17 to either do the Wexler Intelligence Scale for Children, fifth edition, or go ahead from age 16.0 on up with the Wexler Adult Intelligence Scale. Um, and then for children up to age six, it's the WIPSI, which is the Wexler Preschool and Primary Scale of Intelligence. They're, it's all basically the same, the same, um, you know, domains, the same visual spatial, the same, all that, but for that age. And so, that's number one, that's the foundation that's necessary for these boards. They, they want that, they want the full scale. It used to be called IQ, we don't use that word anymore. We say the full scale score. They want the full scale score and they want the individual scores from those five domains. Then they want the subtest scores. The second is the Woodcock-Johnson tests of achievement. There are 11 of them. The Woodcock Johnson recently came out with the fourth edition, um, and I just got it. It's brand new, and there are eleven subtests, and they're more academic. They're sentence reading fluency. How fast can you read a sentence? And yes or no, and you have five minutes. Um, math fluency, where you do computational problems as quickly as you can. There's 160 of them. Do as many as you can in three minutes. And then writing fluency, where you have five minutes to, you're given three words and a picture and you do that as quickly as you can. So basically, and there are 10 other subtests, it's spelling, reading, writing. It's more academic than the WISC. Um, that's the second one that's necessary. And the third one that's necessary is a reading test. For kids between kindergarten and eighth, as I mentioned before, it's the gray oral reading test fifth edition. For kids from ninth to twelfth, it's the Nelson-Denny reading test. And for um, adults, and even from the age of four on up, there's an extra one called the uh, Woodcock reading mastery test that's much more in-depth. So that's a, that's, um, sometimes the board will ask specifically for that one. So those three are the, the three that the board wants, both for the SAT, the ACT, and the SSAT. Those are the three that they need the results of in order to, to determine if the child will um, be eligible for accommodations. Great. And um, after the testing procedure, what happens? Excellent question. Um, after the testing procedure, I go home, I, after the three sessions, um, well, after each session, I go home and I score the material so that, you know, I get an idea of what we should do for the next session. After the three sessions are over and all the scoring is done that I do at home, that takes anywhere from three to five hours, I then write the report 
including the information that the mom or dad gave me during the interview. And I also send mom and dad a questionnaire for each of them about more background information that they fill out. And I include that. And writing the report can take anywhere from um, five to seven hours, depending on the complexity of it. And so I score the material, I write the report, and the most important thing of all is the feedback session. I do hear many stories of children being tested and never getting the results, and even the parents not getting the results or getting the results sent to them and not explained. That's not okay. It's very, very, very important to sit down, even if over Zoom, with the parents first and go over all every line of the report basically and then afterwards we decide together me and the parents they know their child better than anyone in the world what's the what would they like me to tell the child i i definitely want to tell them their strengths and as for the challenges in what manner would their child feel the best about um, me relating what are the challenges to them. You know, I want it to be a positive and wonderful experience where they feel they've learned a lot about themselves. They don't, I don't want them to feel that there's anything wrong with them because there isn't. It's nothing wrong with them. It's just a situation that they have. And so I really, the feedback is so important. After the feedback, then what I do is I ask the parents, would you like to have a meeting at the school with the learning specialist, possibly a few teachers, possibly the principal, and I will have the parents contact the person they feel most comfortable with, and I will directly contact the learning specialist with the parents' permission, and we will arrange a meeting. These days it's over Zoom, but perhaps in the near future, it can be in person like it used to be. And we go over the report. And then the learning specialist is the po point person to the board of the SAT and the board of the SSAT to get those accommodations. It's not me that goes to the board. It's always the learning specialist of the school. And so that's how we get the accommodations. Um, is through the learning specialist. So usually we have a meeting at the school. Um, and that's pretty much the whole kit and caboodle. The last thing I'll mention that's just a little extra that I kind of throw in is I sit with the parents and for no extra fee, I fill out the insurance claim form for them. And um, I get, I, you know, I ask them for their card. We sit there together. I fill it all out. It takes about 40 minutes. They send it in and about I cannot ever guarantee reimbursement, but about 80% of my families in the last year have gotten between 40 and 85% reimbursement. It, usually it needs to be a PPO, but, but that's the very kind of last thing that I, I do. Great, thank you for that, Patty. <laughs> that's super helpful. And I know our audience is gonna be very interested in knowing that they can use their insurance for this and that you you actually provide some assistance with that. Yes. One, one kind of funny question, how long are the results good for, you know, when it comes to, you know, and, I, and maybe it's different for different tests like the ACT or SAT folks, um, what are different companies that administer these standardized tests, but how long are the results good for, for different audiences like the testing agencies, for example, or for schools? Can you speak to that, please? Yes, that's an excellent question. And it's a very simple answer. Three years. <laughs> um, for the ACT, for the SAT, for the SSAT, almost always each one of the boards, the SSAT board is a different company than the SAT board, which is a different company than the ACT board, I, I believe. And it's three years. So um, when we turn in a report to get accommodations, if the report has been done in the last three years, it's still good. Once it passes three years, almost always 
the board of the SAT and the board of the SSAT asks for the um, report, the testing or the assessment to be redone. So the basic answer is three years. Sometimes you can stretch it out to four, but usually three years. Thank you, that's perfect. And finally, as we're gonna have a special offer, and we talked about this, um, you're gonna be offering a complimentary 15 minute introductory consultation for anyone that was, any parents that were listening to this session. And that would be directly with you, Patty. And you've been kind enough to provide both your email and your phone number so that parents can contact you to set that up. Yes. I just really wanna thank you so much today for spending time with us. and educating us on how this process works. And, and it, I think you answered the questions perfectly. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time and I really look forward to working with your clients. Thank you. Thank you.